Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 14th of January 2022 and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 17th of January. And once again we've seen a fairly choppy week for equity markets. US markets have once again um, been driving, I think, the well they have been driving the moves higher and lower um, pretty much across the board. Asia markets have also proved to be fairly choppy without really giving any sort of sense of overall direction going forward. And I think the bigger question that investors are wrestling with at the moment is what sort of central bank um, intervention are we likely to see with respect to um, tightening of monetary policy over the course of the next 12 months? Certainly the narrative from the Federal Reserve has been raised a little bit, or the rhetoric has been raised a little bit um, over the course of the past few days with a raft of policymakers pretty much nailing on the certainty that we will see a rate rise at the March rate meeting. Now, I hear you ask, why would the Fed not decide to go in January in a couple of weeks' time given the fact that there is a meeting between now and the March meeting. And there's a simple answer to that question. The Fed have guided that they are tapering off their asset purchases, um, which are due to end in March. And as such, any tightening of monetary policy is not likely to happen before then. Now, you can argue that the potential, the Fed needs to get going. And certainly there is a school of thought that suggests that they really can't afford to hold off if, as some people are suggesting, um, we could see four rate rises this year starting in March. So essentially we get one in March, one in June, one in September and one in December. Certainly Goldman Sachs has come out and suggested that um, they are in the four rate hike camp. I think the big question is um, whether or not the Fed is behind the curve. And actually, given the data that we've seen this week, whether or not this inflationary surge that we've seen may be on the cusp of topping out. Um, certainly looking at the US CPI numbers, which came in at 7% for December this week, and the China CPI numbers, which actually fell back in December, as did the PPI numbers, um, there is a sense that perhaps we are starting to approach or really get near to the high watermark when it comes to inflationary pressure. Certainly PPI, um, the PPI numbers do appear to suggest that we are starting to see a slowing of the inflationary narrative and could in coming months see um, inflation levels start to level off and potentially tick a little bit lower. Now that's not to say that they're going to come crashing off from the levels that we're currently seeing at the moment. But what we could see is a plateau whereby US inflation hits 7% and then starts to drift back down to 6%, 5% over the course of the next few months as these, these effects start to level off. In that context, obviously, we'll be looking at this week at the latest UK CPI numbers, which are due out on the 19th of January. Um, that's one of the key items on my agenda looking forward, as is UK retail sales for December. They're out on the 21st of January, as well as the latest unemployment numbers and wage growth numbers on the 18th of January. So that's the key UK data. We've also got China's fourth quarter GDP numbers, which are due out on Monday. Um, they're likely to come in at the lower end of expectations. Cast your mind back 12 months and everyone was talking about the potential for the Chinese economy to see annual GDP growth of 6%. Um, I actually thought that was slightly pessimistic as, at the time. Turns out I was wrong on that count and something that I'm perfectly happy to hold my hands up to when the facts change. I change my mind, but I certainly don't change my mind on the basis of one data point. 
but you still need to be flexible enough in your own views to say, well, okay, the data is not actually panning out the way that I suspected it might, and therefore you have to rethink your rationale or your logic for a particular trade idea. And that's one of the that's one of the key things about um, about looking at markets. And the last, that's one thing the last thirty years have taught me: don't let pride get in the way of changing your mind, um, because ultimately changing your mind can save you an awful lot of money in the longer term. Um, you know, it's not a weakness to admit you're wrong. It's a strength. I've learned more from my mistakes than I have from my successes. And I think you have to try and keep that level head when you're looking at financial markets. Um, you know, and that's why I think markets are very, very difficult at the moment. If you look at, say, for example, the, the NASDAQ 100, that's seen an awful lot of volatility over the course of the past few days. Um, and the bias for that is for the market to roll over. Certainly, if you look at US 10-year yields, they tried to go through 1.8% um, last week, um, and they failed. Um, that prompted a little bit of a rebound in the NASDAQ, and they're now around about 1.73% have come off a little bit. And there is an argument to suggest that perhaps on the 10-year, maybe we starting we maybe we are starting to see some evidence of a topping out of the longer term. Um, section of the US yield curve. I mean, let's look at these candles here. The weekly chart at the moment is not really telling me anything instructive. We've seen some very strong moves over the course of the past three weeks. We've seen a little bit of a consolidation here, back to around about 169, 1.69. Um, and for the moment, the chart's not really telling me anything significant in terms of where we can go to next. We're seeing a little bit of a sideways consolidation. And certainly the highs are getting lower, which does suggest a little bit of failing momentum when it comes to the 10-year. So that could be positive for the NASDAQ. But, and there's always a caveat, if you look at the US two-year yield, that is showing no signs at all of actually wanting to start to roll over. And I think that's the one that we really start to want to continue to pay attention to. The US two-year yield is now approaching 1%. Um, so buying UK government, by buying UK, by buying US treasuries, two-year US treasuries, actually gives you a higher return than it does investing in the trailing dividend yield for the NASDAQ, but that's by the by. Anyway, on a technical basis, we are approaching a very key support level on the NASDAQ 100. Certainly in terms of what we're seeing here, the markets are still very undecided. You've got a very long lower candle there, lower wick on that candle there. But those gains soon gave way to a big sell-off here. So the 50-day moving average on the NASDAQ 100 is going to be the key resistance level. And at the moment, that is, you know, while that acts as resistance, the risk is very much towards the downside for the NASDAQ. And if we break below these lows here, this trend line here from the lows here, we could well get to see a significant test of the 200 day moving average. It's a similar sort of picture when we also look at the S&P 500. And again, you know, we are approaching a very key support level. So looking at these two indexes in the round, it's interesting how much they, they, they closely correlate. Certainly again, we've got the very long lower shadows on the candlestick charts, you know, and that's very, very important in the context of the wider scheme of things. So we need to keep a particularly close attention to that um, on any thrusts towards the downside um, and potentially get a rollover in the S&P 500. Um, so those, those, those are the two US markets. US markets are acting as a significant drag on risk appetite. However, that's not the whole story, because if we look at the, the DAX, that's pretty much trading sideways. There's no danger of us really going anywhere on the DAX at the moment. And that still remains very much range bound, but albeit with a bias towards the upside. So nothing really to add there. FTSE 100 is the outperformer so far this year. We've broken higher, 
and continue to track higher. So on the basis of this chart here, I think there's potential, quite a bit of potential for further upside for the FTSE 100 back towards the January peaks that we saw um, just before the pandemic, around about 7,700, 7,690. Certainly a lot more potential for the FTSE 100 to retest the 2020 highs. And certainly that is my bias in terms of the FTSE 100. As long as we're hold above 7,400, which was the breakout level at the end of last year, then for me, the, the bias remains for the FTSE 100 to continue to slowly edge its way higher going forward. We've also seen some significant breakouts on the part of euro dollar. The dollar has weakened despite the prospect that we could see more than three rate hikes this year. Why is that? I mean, that does seem rather counterintuitive that actually we could get four Fed rate hikes um, and yet the dollar weakens. And I think an awful lot of that is positioning based. I think if the Fed hikes rates four times this year, then it's much more likely that other central banks will follow suit. Whereas say, for example, if the Fed only hikes two or three times this year, it's probably more likely that the other central banks will probably do nothing. So what you're getting is potentially a much broader tightening of monetary policy, which may not actually favor the dollar anywhere near as much. Now that may seem a little bit counterintuitive, but you have to basically trade on what the charts are telling you. We've broken through 113.85 on euro dollar and broken through 114. So you could argue that this sort of breakout here suggests that we are going to see another move higher in euro dollar, further dollar weakness towards this series of lows, previous lows through here, which was around about 115.20. And in my on my chart forum posts on the um, on the site, which are here, which can be here, I've basically suggested that we could see a move to 115.20 in on euro dollar over the course of the next few sessions, while we hold above the 114, 113.80 area, which I've identified as the breakout point and the previous resistance level. Um, similar sort of thing with respect to cable, though we are starting to run into a little bit of resistance at the 200 day moving average. But nonetheless, this on the basis of dollar weakness, if we can break above the 200 day moving average, then we can certainly retest these peaks here around about 138.30 and head back towards the 140 level in the short to medium term. Certainly the dollar does appear to be losing a little bit of its luster. And if we look at the CMC dollar index, the fact that we've broken this uptrend line from here would appear to suggest that further weakness is on the way. Therefore, if you extrapolate that out, that would suggest that we're going to see further euro strength, further sterling strength as well, um, which really then begs the question, what happens to euro sterling? Well, again, that's a bit like watching paint dry, but ultimately, I still think that if we can get below 83.30, then the bias remains for a retest of 82.80 initially, and also the, uh, the these these lows back here um, in February 2020. At the moment, 83.30 is proving a little bit of a tough nut to crack, but while we're below 83.80, this series of highs through here, then I think the bias remains for a slow track lower going forward. So, um, look, look at also look at looking at the uh, looking at the wider numbers for next week. I think it I think it's unlikely that um, any of the numbers that we see coming out on from the on the economic data front will point to anything significantly different um, in terms of currency moves, currency direction overall. Um, so UK CPI, we're expecting to see that to edge slightly higher. Um, from 5.2% to 5.3%, and that will be the highest levels um, since above the 2008 highs. Um, levels last seen in March 1992, 5.3%. Um, um, in March 1992, it was 7.1%. So I don't think it'll go that high. Certainly, the Bank of England thinks it could go to 6%. But certainly, overall, markets are now pricing in the possibility that we might see um, a move on rates from the Bank of England in early February. We'll have to wait and see. Certainly the Fed is already indicating that it's going to move in March. 
The bigger question is whether the Bank of England will fall, preempt that and go in February or whether they'll wait till the Fed moves and they go subsequently in at, at, at the following at, at the meeting after that. Unemployment is expected to remain steady at 4.2 percent. Not really seeing um, much um, change in that. We could see it drop a little bit to 4.1 percent, but overall the um, number of vacancies is at a record high, 1.22 million. So you would expect the unemployment rate to continue to fall as we head into 2022. Um, wages, on the other hand, are still um, are still below the level of inflation, so they're negative in real terms. They fell back to 4.3% from 6% in October. Certainly would want to be seeing evidence of that number holding well above 4, maybe edging back up to 4.5 or back towards 5%. As I say, you know, with, with respect to the wages, there is upward pressure on wages, and ideally you'd want to see much higher wages numbers. But I think the likelihood is that we could actually see those fall further, further exacerbating the cost of living squeeze. Retail sales again, the December Plan B restrictions could well impact the retail sales numbers. Certainly the recent retail updates from various um, retailers, Sainsbury's, um, Tesco's, Dunelm, points to fairly decent retail sales activity in December. So even though we've had um, a, a little bit of a slowdown in hospitality uh, and leisure in December, certainly in terms of online retail and um, uh, in general, that has actually been fairly resilient. But nonetheless, you're likely to see that um, retail sales numbers are probably are going to fall back a little bit in December. And even though supermarket food sales will have picked up, I don't think that's going to be enough um, to see retail sales stay in positive territory. Um, certainly the 1.1% rise we saw in October, 2% rise we saw in November, we are going to see a little bit of a slide back in December, simply on the basis of the fact that um, um, simply on the basis of the fact that most people will have already done their Christmas shopping already because of concerns about supply chain restrictions. So you could see a little bit of a decline. Uh, sorry, that was 1.1% in November and 2% in October. So we're probably going to see a decline, or we're predicted to see a decline of 0.6% for December retail sales. Okay, so in terms of inflation, we've also got the latest CPI numbers from the European Union. That's likely to remain um, in line with the flash number that we saw earlier this month, 5%. But certainly the, the warnings from um, the Bundesbank are getting louder that the ECB needs to get its act together when it comes to acting on inflation. Um, President Lagarde's um, consistent um, remarks that rates aren't going anywhere are cutting increasingly little ice with some of the um, northern European economies where you've got PPI levels in and around and above 20 percent. Um, certainly a lot of that is going to start um, trickling down into headline CPI numbers. It already is in Germany, um, which has hit its highest levels of CPI since reunification, well over 5%. And um, at a time when, when um, the, the, the Bundesbank discount rate was 8.75%, not minus 0.5, which is what the ECB rate is right now. So certainly I think the, the noises are getting louder about the risks of pers more persistent levels of inflation. So we've got EU CPI out on the 20th of January. So moving on to companies, and we've got um, Netflix and Goldman Sachs in the, on, in the US, um, but we've also got Primark owner Associated British Foods. We've got JD Weatherspoon, who um, are likely to have been clobbered a little bit in December. Earlier this week, we had Mitchell and Butlers, who own all bar one, report that sales in December were down 10.2%. So I would expect to see um, similar um, numbers from JD Witherspoons. Certainly, I think 
in October, they posted a, they posted a record loss in October of 154.7 million pounds. Um, the most notable statistic from them was a 40% drop in revenues um, to, you know, to 772.6 million pounds. Um, and if you compare that to what it was in 2019, where they, when it was 1.8 billion, you know that's quite a significant um, loss. So um, the announcement of December restrictions did prompt Weatherspoons to issue a trading update at the time to the effect that this week's numbers could see the business slip, slip to a first half loss. So you could argue that the the bad news there is already in the price. Deliveroo, what a nightmare. Deliveroo, flopperoo, whatever you want to call it. Re record lows for the share price here. The IPO was 390p. We are now at 172p. And despite a brief recovery in August, which saw Delivery Hero by a 5% stake, the shares have pretty much gone one way, um, which sort of begs the question as to why Delivery, Delivery Hero thought it was a good idea to. Um, to buy into Deliveroo. Having said that, despite the declines that we've been seeing in the share price, um, the company's been raising guidance consistently. In Q3, Deliveroo raised its guidance for the for um, uh, raised its guidance for GDP for this number to between 60 and 70 percent. Gross profit margins unchanged at seven and a half to 7.75 percent. Um, Plan B restrictions could have actually boosted uh, Deliveroo's GTV transaction volumes, and they've also signed um, deals with Amazon and Morrison's. So, big question is how much further can can the share price fall? Well, looking at that trend, probably quite a bit lower. But at some point, you're probably going to see some interest start to trickle in. And then we'll move on to Primark. Again, here. You could have seen a drop off in foot. You could have seen a drop off in footfall um, as a consequence of the December um, Plan B restrictions, as more people stayed at home to avoid getting sick ahead of Christmas. Um, nonetheless, seen a fairly decent rebound there. If we look at full-year revenues for last year, this is this is going to be the first quarter update for 2022. Full-year revenues came in at 13.9 billion for last year which was only slightly lower than the previous year. So certainly ABF have done very, very well in managing to recoup all of that lost revenue as a result of the lockdowns. And also their other businesses have been doing fairly well as well. So there's certainly scope for them to continue to move higher. Um, Netflix, this is getting caught up in the tech sell-off. So that could be interesting. Um, there's low expectations around the latest numbers from Netflix, and I think this needs to be put into context. Revenues have been growing. They improved in Q3, um, coming in at 7.4 billion, or expected to come in at 7.7 .7 billion in Q4. Um, they're investing an awful lot in new content. High spending on content will probably see margins decline to 6.5% during this quarter from 23.5%. But full year operating margins are still expected to come in at 20% or slightly better. Profits are expected to come in quite a bit lower again as a result of this investment in new content to 80 cents a share. Um, and also, they're um, a little bit more cautious about subscriber numbers, subscriber number growth. Um, certainly, that is going to be a concern. But certainly, in terms of the, the, the new content that's come out this quarter, We've seen new series of The Witcher, Cobra Kai, Tiger King, Lost in Space. Still waiting for the new series of Stranger Things. Um, so I think even um, when measured against um, subscriber growth numbers, I think the real focus here needs to be less on subscriber growth numbers and more on revenue growth. And at the moment, there doesn't appear to be showing any signs of a slowdown there. Um, so big support in and around this trend line here which currently comes in just below $500 a share. So keeping an eye on that, that, that one there. Goldman Sachs. Bank earnings starting this week with JP Morgan and Citigroup. As I'm talking now, I don't know what those numbers are. 
but certainly I think the recent uh, report this week that Goldman Sachs commodities trading revenue for the year came in well above $2.2 billion at a record, a record does bode well for the 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 18th of 18th of January Q4 numbers. Um, Q4, Q4 profits are expected to come in lower than Q3. Again, most estimates for Goldman Sachs usually have tended to miss the mark by quite some way. They've usually tended to fall. Um, the, the profits have usually tended to come in well above expectation. So I don't expect this to be any different. Um, nonetheless, anything above $11.60 a share is likely to be fairly well um, greeted. But again, sideways trading in terms of Goldman Sachs share price over the course of the past few weeks. So keep an eye on $370 a share. That could well see um, a, a bit of a test if the numbers disappoint. So keep keep an eye, keep an eye on that key support level there, $370 a share for Goldman Sachs. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, once again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you all have a great week, a great weekend, and a great trading week. And I'll speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for listening.